Hi developers and content creators, my name is Mehul and I'm the founder of CodeDam and in this crash course video, we're going to be taking a look at how to develop courses of tomorrow. Programming and education and coding education especially is going to be interactive. Interactive coding is the future. Long gone are the days where you would learn just from textbooks and video courses alone. Now with technologies like code dams, you can build courses which are much more engaging, hands-on, practical, and almost gives a bootcamp level setting. These courses will allow you to build courses which are interactive, which includes evaluative concepts, which includes people to actually think what they have learned and what they have written and I'm gonna help you learn everything there is necessary for these courses to be built. I'm excited to take this journey with you for the next few minutes where we will spend time setting up an interactive course, learning about the concepts, how do you build a course in the first place and I'm going to be covering a lot more things along the way. If you're new here, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. This is free of cost and helps the channel grow. Hey everyone, let's start with a full video on how to build interactive coding courses on CodeDam. I'm going to make it very clear about a few things. The first thing is that the interfaces and the UI might change, but our team will make sure that we keep on updating these courses. But even if they don't in a while, then make sure you just fight a little to understand where the new controls are, because we are always updating the UI, the platform, the features, the stability. So it might be here and there sometimes, but we'll make sure that nothing on the URL part breaks. So if I'm telling you a specific URL, that should work. If a specific flow is there, that should also work. With that being said, let's get started. I would want you to take a back seat and start taking notes as well, as well as if you want to record a few parts of, you know, just list down a few things which are important to you. Just do that because trust me, this is the last non-interactive video tutorial you are seeing. Because once you understand how to build interactive coding courses, that is all you're gonna do for the rest of your life as a content creator and as someone who can deliver the best experiences to the end users in today's time. All right, so without wasting any time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and go to codedam.com slash instructor. Now, the reason I'm telling you to go to codedam.com slash instructor and not just click on teach dot teach on codedam is because we might remove this link or we might change something later in the navigation but this link would remain there. Either that or you can just Google on code damn instructor, something like that, and you will arrive at this particular page. Now click on this particular link and you will see a button as sign up as an instructor. Again, this might change, things might change, but look for a button which enables you to sign up as an instructor. Now to sign up as an instructor, you need a regular CodeDAM account. And in order to do that, just sign up with Google for now. You can sign up with Google or you know, you can sign up with your email address as well. Once you go ahead and sign in, or once you go ahead and log in, just click on the instructor dashboard, go to the instructor dashboard. This is the place where you will spend a lot of time. And of course, like by the time you're viewing this, again, I'm sorry to say this, but again, I have to say this multiple times because we work and ship very fast. So this UI, and everything could be changed, but the fundamentals remain same. So an instructor dashboard on CodeDAM lists down basically everything from your reviews to your fine-tuned analytics on how much revenue you have made, how much sales you have done, how much views you have, how much code runs you have. And don't worry about this data. This is dummy account, uh, which is my own official email ID. So this data doesn't mean anything for this particular account, but it will for your account. And this is real-time data. So you can see everything in a single place. We're going to talk about more about this once we publish our courses, but let's keep our focus on this important task which is how to build interactive coding courses. And this is exactly what we're going to be discussing in this full video. All right, so let's take a look at how do you create a new course? Well, you click on the create a new course button to start. For now, what we do is we show you the full UI for creating a course in a single screen. The way this would work is your course will have a title, a subtitle, a slug and description and a few more metadata. Now, if I walk you through an already published course, you will understand the importance of this. So take a look at this course which is a published course on the platform, right? So I'm going to just mute this tab real quick. Oh, it's already muted so that the video does not play when I start. So you can see that this particular course over here is a pro course. It's a pro subscription course. It's a paid course, but it's a very well laid out course with description, course structure. Reviews are also down there. You can modify what your subtitle or the theme of the course is, and you can modify the title of your course. These things, these bits are important because they allow your user, they allow the reader to instill confidence on why this course is the one. And of course, like you can modify them to include information like this course is interactive. So, you know, you can go ahead and highlight those bits to make it truly stand out of any other video based course. Let me also quickly show you how does an interactive course look like. So 
the expectations are straight on what exactly you are building in the first place. So an interactive course would look something like this. Once your course is ready and it's published, your course can consist of multiple videos, articles, quizzes, all of that is fine. But the most important part is this lab item. This lab over here, this icon denotes the type of the content you are going to expect in this. But this lab item over here is the one which would instill interactivity within your course and make it stand out of video streaming courses. So let's take a look at this lab. Block level and inline level tags in HTML. Now, when I talk about lab, you can also embed a video inside it as a helper video, which people can move around and people can see whenever they want. Otherwise, they can just hide this video and restore it from here. And again, all of this is something which we will discuss, but just wanted to run this by you so that you have an idea on what we are building. So you see, this is a very simple lab, which is super interactive in nature. And you can see how we are able to just walk through and how we are able to just switch tabs and see a full command line interface to us. Now the challenges in this lab as you can see your code half should have valid p element we don't have a p element we have now your p element should have text of hello paragraph right so let's say I add this hello paragraph right and let's say I don't do the third challenge your p element should have a closing tag so if I go ahead and now run these tests you're going to see that you have such a fine control over every aspect of this challenge that you can see the kind of content they have written, the output they have written, everything. So you can control precisely what's working and what's not working, right, for the user. And the moment a user is stuck, they can also check your verified solution and see exactly what they are missing on. So I'm exactly missing on a closing P tag. And once I do that, that fixes things. I can run test and I can see that I pass. So this is the kind of experience you can deliver to your students at scale. Now this is the bit which is important. This experience is at scale. So you can create these courses once, distribute it to thousands and tens of thousands of people and we'll help you do that as a platform and they can just practice and learn on their own. So you don't have to be actively involved. Moreover, all of these web-based tutorials and something which involves browser also comes with dev tools installed. So we are always working towards providing the best experience possible to these end users so that you have to only focus on the code and the practice and the challenges part. All right, with that being said, I just wanted to show you part of the labs, but let's just go back to building an interactive course. I'm gonna make sure that we get with the boring stuff quickly, get through with the boring stuff quickly. So I'm gonna just set up a title and a subtitle real quick. So I've just populated the HTML and CSS course with some data. You can see introduction to HTML programming, basic stuff. You can change all of this later and you can also change your course luck before you publish it. But I would recommend thinking through what your course luck should be because this can also affect your SEO. So if you have like a course on Golang, for example, or Rust or something, then make sure you include your primary keyword in the slug. This is what will be the URL of your course. A course pricing tier is also something you can change later, but we recommend like starting with $19.99, that's a fair price to start, or you can just push it a little bit up as well if you want. Then a course description is your way to attract people. You can use all sorts of markdown here and you can make sure that, you know, this is the best sort of description of what the person will learn in your course. Primary and secondary categories for us to make sure we boost your course properly under search results so it's a request then you know make sure you have the proper category set on your course and what will students learn here will just give a list of objectives and goals to these students when they are browsing your course on the landing page once you're done with this you can also upload a course image if you want or you can just save these changes and do it later once you save these changes you're going to see that you are redirected to the course curriculum page. Now, this is the page where you will spend most of your time as an instructor. Now, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of stuff, there are a lot of things happen over this particular page. First thing you have to understand is that the content is always split into sections. The way it works is that you build a course, an interactive course, and you split the content into multiple sections. Now it's completely up to you how do you organize these sections. This could be introduction, then getting more into the content, you know, getting into advanced stuff and so on, or it could be some other way. But what we recommend is that a section should not be too short, that it just consists of a, let's say a single video or something. And it should also not be too long that the whole course is in a single section. It should be just crisp enough so that it captures all the information required in the section but it should not be like, you know, too long, like I mentioned. So let's just say I start with introduction to HTML as my first section. Now in this particular section, what I'm gonna do is let's say add an article as the first thing. So you can see, I just added a quick 
introduction so you can see i just added a quick article on welcoming the users to the course and a little bit about html i'm going to save this article and i'm going to dismiss this and once i do that i can also publish this item now when you publish a particular item that is made available in that course now there are two things to understand here the first thing is that the course in itself could be in a published state or a draft state and the second thing is the every individual course item could be in a published state or a draft state when we talk about course items you can work on course items in a published course as well and when you publish an item in a published course it becomes live to the end users if you publish it right now it's not live to anyone because this course is not published in the first place so you can either convert it to draft or you can keep it published that's up to you it's fine you can structure your course later eventually if you want i'm going to keep all the course items as draft for now so that we just publish the ones which we need eventually now you see that there is an estimation duration estimated course duration associated as well and this is automatic so we will compute your estimated course duration based on let's say if it's an article we will use the word count to determine how fast a user an average user reads and that is how your course duration will be computed it's easier in case of videos because we can use the, just the length of the video itself it's slightly tricky in case of interactive labs which i'll get into how we compute that but the articles is also straightforward we use the average reading speed and we uh, determine the duration with that now let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about video course items so video course item is a pretty standard way of adding some video to your course and this is something which we actually recommend which might seem a little bit weird because i say like interactive courses is the future but videos is a great way to connect with your audience it's not about giving them practice or anything or teaching them as well it's about connecting with your audience people like to see face and if you use your first few videos to just showcase who you are as a person if you want to and you have the correct lighting setup and everything go with that or if you want to walk them through a particular concept screen share show them something that's also a perfect way interactive or labs is not the only way to teach it's just the way to make your users experience so great that they don't give up in your course between now the way the video works is that you have to upload your videos on codedam and we will handle the processing we will slightly compress them for the web format we will see what's the best resolution for the user to be delivered and once all of that is done you can click on this edit item and you can click on this add video and you can link your available video because this will only show the videos which are available so you have to upload them first wait for a few hours or minutes and once it is available for processing you can link it to your course item for now because we don't have a video link i'm just going to remove this the next thing which i want to talk about is a quiz a quiz again is a very simple way of adding question to your course and quizzes keep the interactivity going keep the things going if in case you think like lab is too much at this particular point so you can just add a quiz question now a quiz question can, can be a single correct or a multiple correct quiz question that means your quiz can have questions like who discovered python for example who who <laughs> not discovered who invented python which is a, like a single correct thing to multiple correct questions like what are some popular programming languages for front end so any one of this can go you can also add an explanation for your answer so let's say if i have a question who or let's say what does the javascript code below evaluate to and let's say we just have a simple statement console log one plus one now i can add a bunch of options i can say this is one this is two this is three this is four and i can mark that two is the correct answer right because this is a single correct so i have to select two as the correct answer if it was multiple correct i could select multiple questions or multiple options but since it's single i'm just going to keep two as the correct answer now i can also add an explanation for this i can say 1 plus 1 is actually 2 that is why it is the correct answer and this explanation will be shown to the users every single time the answer the quiz whether that's correctly or whether that's incorrectly so that they get to know why the correct answer was correct in the first place so let's save this quiz and let's close this down and you can see now this is also available to be published now the final thing which is left to talk about is a lab now this lab is an interesting bit because this will help you make the best courses of your life 
and this is slightly complex it slightly has a learning curve but you once you understand how to build a lab it will be a game changer for the courses you're going to build all right let's try to understand labs in general on codedam and let's understand the fundamentals of building a lab because if you understand them then you can understand everything and you can do anything you want because that is how our architecture is going to remain for the longest time of course i mean we would not change anything that will break what i will teach you about the fundamentals but we can like i said shift the ui here and there for some of the things so let's start i have added a lab and i'm going to click on this edit item now the way the labs work is currently in two ways you can create an interactive lab or you can create an io lab an io lab is a very simple lab where you just have to add what input do you want to give to the user program and what output do you expect like simple lead code stuff where you just add the user has to write a code get the input spit out the output but on codedam our power lies in interactive labs these interactive labs are the labs where you get to express more like the html lab which i showed you you can take a look into the file system of users you can open a headless browser you can check out what you know the api is doing by calling it via fetch and so on so how does this work well the first thing you have to do is enter a lab title that's how it all begins so let's say i just want to check if user wrote h1 tag or whatever right so let's create an interactive lab out of this now once this lab is there what i would recommend you is to link it with the course item which you have right so you see this lab got linked but this lab is still incomplete you can publish it but i mean it's no good so what i'm going to do is click on the edit item again and this time you can see when you click on edit for a linked lab it just opens the lab editor directly you can see that lab editor creating a single lab in itself is like a bunch of steps right so let's do it step by step first of all just write a basic description about the lab itself in this lab you have to write an h1 tag and enter your name inside it make sure that your h1 tag is closed right now let's just go ahead and save and continue now on the container image screen what i would recommend is just choose a technology with which you are creating a lab for the most part this is just a hint for us for the platform we use uh, the way virtualization and the way code and playgrounds work is currently we use docker to boot up these containers right and all of these images all of the languages any of the language which you select here it's going to use the same underlying image but this just gives us a hint on what sort of lab you are creating and based on that particular hint you can see on the right there is valuable and useful information which can be used by you so let's say if you are creating a python lab we're going to give you a hint or a documentation link to how to create an interactive lab with python right so of course in this whole video series my aim is to make it clear fundamentally how labs and interactive courses on codedam generally works but you can once you're done with this whole video you can go over to this documentation resource and study more if you would like to so anyway let's get back to where we were in this case because this is just a hint almost like a hint i'm just going to select an html and css js plain template i'm going to click on save and next and the next thing which i have to select is a lab layout now a lab layout consider a lab layout as a again as a default environment in which the user starts their work now do you want to give them a full terminal at the bottom an editor and an ide do you want to just give them a terminal and an ide that means no browser preview and this is something which you will actually use for let's say if you are building a c++ course because of course like in initial cases where you are not writing a web server there is no real reason of giving a you know a terminal the browser to the user you can also just have terminal for plus browser this is suitable for some applications where you know terminal starts a browser process and all the user can do is something within the browser itself not super recommended for a lot of labs but this exists if you want and we also have a terminal only view where the whole screen is just terminal this is again useful if you are let's say just doing some cli tutorials like you want the user to navigate through the file system and find a specific file and read its contents and you know do something with it so then this is what something you will do in this case we want a terminal an ide and a browser because we want to show the html preview to the user so that's 
the next step. Lab defaults is also something interesting and would require us to learn a new concept of CDMRC. So think of lab defaults as follows. When you boot a playground, when you start even locally, when you start a project, when you resume the work on a project, you start with an existing file system, right? Similarly, playgrounds, when they are booted, we give you, the creator, the option to start it with a specific file system. So that means you don't have to tell the end user to create multiple files or clone a repository or do something. This is what lab defaults do. Lab defaults allow you to specify a file system to start the playground with. Now, the important thing which you have to be careful about here is that this lab default or the default file system through which the user starts, it's just the source, right? That means the moment the user modifies that lab to their own contents, and then let's say they refresh the lab or they come visit the lab the next day, they will not boot from this particular source. They will have the option to reset the lab, but their contents will be restored exactly where they left. That is, you know, where they made the changes. That means everyone starts from a single repository as a single source of truth for that particular lab's starting point. But the moment they boot that lab, it creates a copy of the file system of their own, right? So this means that if you, let's say at some point, create a lab and update this repository later, it will not update the file contents or the file system of the users who have already used your lab. That is why in case you want to update a lab ever, the best way to do about that, and you have to modify the file systems and your course is also published. That's also a criteria. The best way to do about that is to create a clone of this lab and you know just set it up again. Because if you don't, there might be uh, people who revisit the lab and that lab might appear broken. So anyway, let's consider the fact about what this default repository and what these master branches and everything is. So what we need from you as a creator is give us a repository link to boot the lab from, right? And this repository, for example, this Mayhole MPT and empty, it's pretty much an empty repository which just contains two files, CDMRC and README. Now, you can specify any sort of repository over here. It could be a React.js or even a Node.js core repository, doesn't matter. We will clone this repository and we will make it available as a file system to the end user, which I'll show you in a while. Let's talk about CDMRC as a file. Now you see, if I go ahead and click on test this lab, which you can at any point and it will open a new tab, which will show you the most recent update to your particular lab. It's actually a good way to just make sure that nothing is breaking in your lab itself. So if you go ahead and see that, so you can see the moment it boots, you can see that this these are the two files which are available in this GitHub repository as well. And they got cloned and I can, as a user, I can check and edit these files and start working on it. I also have a view, a browser view on the right, and I have a terminal at the bottom. So you see, this is the view which I selected, but there is nothing running on the right because we don't have any server started. And we'll talk about that bit as well. Now let's talk about CDMRC, because if you paid attention, when I reloaded this page, what happened was that this particular tab, readme.md, just opened automatically, right? I did not do anything, it just opened automatically. If we take a look at this file, cdmrc, you're gonna see that this is a YAML file. This is actually a YAML configuration file, which has tabs as the property as readme.md. Let's go ahead and add cdmrc as well to this particular array, right? And once I do that, I'm gonna give it a refresh, and you're gonna see that once this lab boots up, this time, both the tabs are available, right? So this is a configuration file, which will help you determine a few more defaults of the playground. Now, of course, we can keep those defaults over here, but it's better to keep them in a configuration because this gives users also the ability to toggle a few things. So tabs is one of the property. Another property, set of properties, which you can take a look at is if you go to teach.codedam.com, building labs, concepts, CDMRC. If you take a look at this particular page using CDMRC on teach.codedam.com slash docs concept CDMRC, you're gonna see that there is a bunch of documentation. You can have terminals doing things. So you can have multiple terminals booted up the moment a lab starts. So let's try this out. If I have terminals here, echo one, two, three, let's say if I add echo four as well, and if I just give it a refresh, just give it a second to save and give it a refresh, you're gonna see 
that the moment this lab now boots up, you don't see anything because the container was already running. So let's just give it a reset of lab. And let's just try to take a look now, once this refreshes now. So you can see the moment the lab again booted, it started four terminals with echo one, two, three, and echo four, right? Now, of course, you don't have to have so many terminals right away with you, but you can use this to set this up. The next set of command, which you have is tabs, which you have already taken a look at. Then you also have a live browser reloading, which is something I don't think you need to worry a lot about because we already have live browser reloading uh, as a native feature in the playground. We also have a run button thing and a run button thing. What this does is that if you have this particular command with you, it will add a button at the top saying, you know, uh, this particular command should run in a new terminal or in an existing terminal if the terminal is free, the moment somebody clicks on that button. And this double dollar file is a variable which would be replaced by whatever file currently is active. So if I have this run button command, a new run button appears for the user and the user can just click on that button and he'll run it as node.cdmrc, right? Or if, if I'm on readme, then it will run it as node readme.md. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, this code is the same directory as the one which is available here. And this is the path at which this is available. This terminal shell is a ZSH shell. So you can just, uh, you know, make use of shortcuts which are available in ZSH as well. There are a few more options available in the CDMRC file. I would recommend you to go through them, but for the most part, the only options you're going to need are tabs and terminals. Now tabs, because you need specific files to be open for the users, you should have that. And terminals is super important because it kickstarts your lab, right? Even if you have an index.html file here, even if you have something like this, you still need to run this as a static, you know, as a server or server of some sorts. So how would you do that? You would run it with a default command, which will be with CDMRC tabs. So this is all about how you can work with CDMRC in order to configure the initial booting experience of the user. Now let's set up this repository. Now in order to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and go to classrooms folder and I'm gonna go ahead and create a folder building interactive coding course, right? I'm going to make this as a Git repo. I'm going to keep this very simple because we don't need to do a lot of things here. So I'm going to touch an index.html file and I'm going to touch a CDMRC file. Let's just edit CDMRC for now. So I'm going to say the tabs is index.html, of course, and the terminals or, you know, uh, commands, a set of commands, which I have to run is as follows. Now I want you to understand a few things. When I talk about a specific language or a specific implementation, let's say in this case, running HTML lab or running a node lab, there are things which we can do. Now over here, what you can do is you can use something known as a static server binary. Now this is a binary which we provide by default. If you go down, if you go to the HTML CSS uh, setting up interactive lab, you're going to see that this is clearly mentioned over here that how do you set up a static server binary? So what this static server binary will do in this particular case is that it will start a static server for your user. Now you can use this particular static server binary or you can use any other way, but our recommended way to start a static server on code playgrounds is using this binary. Why? Because it automatically takes care of live reloading in the playground. So your user does not have to refresh, constantly refresh if anything changes. So the way you will set this up is you're going to just say static server port should be 1337, right? Now the reason I'm saying this, and you can also add a no cache flag over here so that it's not cached at all. Now, the reason I'm using static server just like this is because we have made it globally available in the playground and we will not deprecate it. The next thing is this port has to be 1337. Now, in order to understand that, we're going to go back and understand a little bit about port mapping on CodeDAM. So the way port mapping on CodeDAM works is that currently we expose two ports from within the container to outside world. Now you see when you're working on your local system, you can run anything on any particular port, right? And you can access it in the browser with local host and port 3000, 8000, 10,000. That's fine. But if we are running that inside a container, we have to make it available on internet as well. That is how the user can see, you know, what the output is or what, 
generally is the thing. Now the way to do that is we map a particular port locally in the container to a URL which is available for that particular lab session. And the way we do that is port number 1337 is mapped to port number 1337 on, on the particular URL. And similarly for port number 1338, it's mapped to port number 1338. So that means if anything is started on port number 1337, it would be accessible if I visit this particular URL where this part will be changed, right? This part could be anything. Now, one more thing which you have to understand is by default, the browser link which is available in the right side of the sidebar, right side of the iframe is that particular domain with a port 1337. So you see in the documentation, it is written that by default, we open whatever the host is assigned to you, .codedam.app 1337 in an iframe browser preview on the right. However, you can override this with the CDMRC configuration. But of course, we don't want to do that because then we will lose the ability to show something to the user because this whatever host is assigned to you is not in control of you as a creator. This is something which we assign randomly to the user based on, you know, any random factor. So this is not a permanent domain. This is a temporary domain. So if you leave browser link out of it, this is the URL which is hard coded right to the particular playground 1337. That is why I'm saying that you have to start the static server on 1337 and not on 1338. So that's it. The moment we do this, we can also edit index.html. I can just say, write something about yourself in h1 tag. And once I do that, I can have a, so you can see I've already set up my Git repo with the GHCLI. You can do it from the GitHub dashboard as well. That's completely fine. You can go to github.com and create a new repository if you want. From here, you can do that. Or what you can do is just use the GH GitHub CLI, which I use to create a repository at the origin and just, you know, push the repository. Now, one of the prerequisites of creating interactive labs is that you are familiar, slightly familiar with GitHub. So I would assume that if not, then of course, like we have interactive coding tutorials on CodeDam on how to learn Git. So make sure you check them out. So once this is pushed, you can see, I would be able to see uh, this particular repository over here. And what I can do next is I can take this as a GitHub repository and I can replace my empty one with this one. And my branch in this case is main. Now, this is also important thing. When you're building a course, the recommended way of building it is that you have a single repository for all the exercises and everything, single repository for the single course, and you can have different branches for different labs, right? So this might as well have been lab one instead of main. Branch doesn't mean a lot here. It's just a way to, you know, have a single repository, but multiple labs in different branches but we can keep it main for now. Now, if I go ahead and save, move forward, you're gonna see that the CDMRC preview gets updated. So just for your quick reference to see if everything is in place. And now if I go ahead and test this lab, now if you change repositories and everything, like I said, you have to reset your file system. So make sure you do that. I'm just gonna go ahead and reset this because this is an older file system that boots. So once you do that, just reset it. And this time when the new file system opens, you're going to see that this is the updated one, right? Index.html static server is there. And you can see down here, a static server also started on port 1337. And suddenly we no longer have that loading screen. We just have a white screen, which is exactly what you would expect if you are working on an empty page. So if I go ahead and take a look at the view source, you can ignore this part because this is like just our live server thing. But this is the thing which is write something about yourself in h1 tag, which is what is available inside this index.html file, right? Now this script, which you just saw was inserted because of the static server, right? The static server binary. If you use any other way of starting this as a static server, which you can, let's say with Python, Python 3, um, HTTP.server, port 1337. If you do something like this, I'm just missing out on the syntax, but you get the idea. If you start it like that, you will miss out on the live reloading part. That's why it's recommended that you keep it live with static server. So once you do this, you can see now you can control the file system for the end user. 
And that's great because now you can give them a starting point in the lab. Combine this with the instructions, it's a solid way to start the lab, right? Because now you can tell the user what they have to do. You have set up an environment for them. You have set up some commands and CLI for them to start off with. And it's a great start for a user. Now let's move forward from this tab and let's come to the evaluation tab because this is again, one of the most important things which you can add to the lab. Your lab is partially ready, but it's still an open-ended thing. You told the user to do something, but we are not really enforcing whether this is something which is the user will do or not, right? Uh, we are in no way checking if the user has done the right thing and so on. So how do we enforce some challenges or how do we add some specific challenges that is something which we can do with the evaluation tabs all right let's talk about challenges now you can see on the right i added two challenges you should have an index.html file and you should have an h1 tag on the page now these are two challenges and there are two hints for them we can work on the ui a little bit better here which is also a work in progress so you might see something different by the time you're seeing this but for now, these are hint blocks and these are challenges block. So if I save them and if I, let's say, test the lab again, what you're going to see is you're going to see a new tab over here, which will show us challenges. And you can see that there are two red icons and a title or of the challenge, right? So that is how you add a challenge to your lab. Now, the next step is how do you evaluate them? Because there are two kinds of challenges. The first kind is evaluative challenge, which you have added. The second kind is self assess challenge, which you can also add. So you can have something like you should have your name inside H1 tag, right? So this is something which the user anyway has to do on their own. So if you add this, it'll add a self assess challenge and you can, as a user, you have to click on the button to mark this as done. But evaluative challenges is where the fun is because you can use evaluative challenges and write scripts to test the functionality of the code of the user, right? So how do we do that? Well, this is where the interesting part lies. The first thing is you have to write these challenges over here. I mean, with this, so you can have multiple challenges, as many challenges as you want. Once you have done that, it will create the UI for it on the playground. Once that has also been done, you now have to assess or you now have to toggle these challenges from red to green based on what the user wrote. Now, one way to do that is to do it continuously, like on every keystroke, we just keep on assessing, which is slightly insane. Another way is to provide a run test button, which is exactly what we do. So what the user can do is the user can work on it, like they can do, do whatever they want. And once they are done with this, once they are satisfied with the result, they can click on this run test button. The moment they click on this run test button, you as a creator again are in control. When, when the user clicks on this run test button, this block of code runs. Whatever you want to write here would run, right? And this block of code is actually running as bash or ZSH, I should say. So any sort of ZSH command which you write over here would execute the moment somebody clicks on this run test button. Now you might be asking like, how do I go from a ZSH code execution block to actually making these challenges red and green based on, you know, uh, the functionality. In other words, how do you set up your testing environment over here? Now for that, you should use a cheat code, which we provide. And that cheat code is this particular GitHub repository which we have just mentioned over here as a command. You should check and use a default testing command from the GitHub repository. So you see, we have done a few things. We have done four scripts for now. And you know, usually a lot of web development cases can be covered with them itself. So if you take a look at node vtesttesting.sh, you're gonna find a bash script, which does exactly that. It sets up vtest as a testing utility, and then you can use vtest to test for anything right let's say node.js uh, code base of the user this is a very big script so we're gonna not start with this what i'm gonna start off with is a very simple thing very simple observation within the script that is like let's say if i just want to run a node script on you know on this run test button how do i do that well i can do this with following like i can write node test file.js right but what is this test file well we do give you an option to specify an optional test file. This optional test file can be accessed with this edit test file button. Currently, the way this works is that you get to work 
on a single file consider this as just a regular file which you can where you can write and dump anything right you can have a console log hello world here it doesn't matter you save this now you can access this file this is a special kind of file because it's just you know it's not even special this file just exists but you can access this file inside this bash command prompt and the way to do that is through a variable called test file name right so this particular variable this environment variable gets populated with the path of this particular file right so if i save this lab over here right now what's going to happen is that the moment i click on this run test button in this particular lab it's going to run node this particular file and this file will just console log hello world let's take a look so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to click on this run test button and inside the test result logs you can see that the std out is actually hello world right and it says me an error message that could not calculate results is your code crashing because we have not done a few important things in the process but you can see that the std out of your test file is actually saying hello world and it'll say the same thing if you just echo something over here because this is just a bash script now that we have gone through a mapping like run test actually executes this block and this block can help you execute a single file which we provide on the platform how do we make this file turn these buttons or these challenges red or green well the secret to doing that is actually writing on a special file and again that special file can be found over here inside the unit test output file environment variable so inside node.js you can access environment variables through process.env.unit test output file inside of bash you can access it with dollar sign so this particular variable again contains the path to a file on which if you write the result it will turn these challenges red or green that's all that's all it we have to do now let me just show you what i mean by that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write a very simple node.js script so i'm going to say fs is require fs and i can say fs dot write file sync on this particular path because this is a path not of you know not any special variable and then what i want to write well what i want to write is a boolean array let's say true true right so if i write something like this here's what's going to happen we have two challenges right now if i click on run test you're going to see both of them turned green why the reason for that is like i said at the end of your testing script all we're going to do is we're going to see that what is written on the unit test output file file right what is written as a array inside this particular file and we're going to map every single value to every single challenge in a specific order so this first true over here maps to this particular challenge the second true over here maps to this particular challenge which brings us to another important observation that the length of this array of this boolean array should be equal to the number of challenges which you have added right now let's say i make this false and the second one is true let me save this lab uh, this file let me just run this test again so you see because my first challenge is false now my test did not pass because you should have an index.html file is false now because i did not create an index.html file you should have an h1 tag it's true because this says it's true right now how do we make this dynamic and actually related to functionality well again this depends on language to language you can write this this file can be written in python and this can be executed with python 3 that's completely your choice but i'm doing this with node.js and a simple way to do that is just use a bunch of try catch blocks this is one way i'm going to go through a bunch of ways so let's say i want to check if index.html file exists right so what i'm going to do is let me just check what the current working directory is this is home dammer code and index.html file is over here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use node.js skills my node.js skills i'm going to check does index file exist and i'm going to say fs.exist sync and i'm going to specify the full path to index.html and i'm going to say if does index file exist then okay otherwise you know just not going to work so what i can do over here is i can maintain a results array which is a boolean array so i'm going to say results dot push true that means this test pass because the index file exists otherwise i can say results dot push false 
well this one did not need a try catch but some challenges might have might need it so you can just keep it like this the second challenge which you have is you should have an h1 tag on the page right and did you create an h1 tag inside the index.html file now how do you do this well multiple ways to do this again the first one is that you just send a fetch request to this particular url and get the contents and just check the second one is you spin up a full puppeter browser and see what the page is we're gonna be discussing about the puppeter approach in a while but let's just take a look at now how do you do it with a basic fetch request thing so for the fetch request thing i can have a try catch block right because the network request can fail you might be thinking that how do i get contents of url right now how do we determine what this particular url is which is a sign because i said that this is dynamic and this can change well the good thing is this test result this lab actually runs inside this particular container that means you don't have to get access to this url all you have to do is get access to localhost 1337 which you can do in this so what you can do is use fetch and you would need fetch from node fetch because we are running node.js 14 for now on this and what you can do is just use localhost 1337 and then all you have to do is just get the text content of it and then finally in order to evaluate this what you can do is check if contents of url dot includes h1 then you know results dot push this is like just one hacky way to evaluate it otherwise you just say results dot push false right that's one way you could have just read the file system as well that would have also worked and because now we need a wait so we have to put this inside of a function async function check results and i can just say something like this and now i can also write this finally like this and i can say check results that then console.log done right so what we are doing is fetching now we are checking if any h1 tag exists if it does if it does then we just push through otherwise we push false and the network request fails then also we just push false and finally instead of writing a hard-coded array we just stringify our array and just write it like this on the file so this is a very very simple and raw testing script which i just wrote in node.js now if i save this you're gonna see that if i go back and if i click on this run test button now we get both of these uh, as passed if i remove this for example and if i run test now you're gonna see that my second challenge fails because there is apparently no h1 tag right but there are a few problems because you can see that even if i have like h1 like this as a comment it still passes because we are checking it via equality right we are just checking if it this file contents includes the h1 but it actually does not so in order to avoid things like this you can also spin up a full browser to test for the functionalities but i hope this gives you a basic idea of how to test with code damn infrastructure put in the test first put in a bash script which starts that test use this file as a starting point or use this file as something as a you know as a testing a unit or e2e test thing for your lab and make sure by the end of this file execution you have written a boolean array which is same in length as the number of challenges you have added the moment you do this it's just gonna be magic right because rest of the things our architecture will take care of so what we have to do next is that we have to see how do we add let's say how do we use a puppeter instance to spin up a full browser and check what the user is doing all right let's take a look at how you can do this with puppeter now and fortunately again we have like a few pre-made templates for things like these for puppeter for example so what i can do is select this puppeter template and click ok which replaces a lot of contents of my file but that's something i can work with so again we have an async run function we have imported puppeter puppeter also comes pre-installed in code damn playground images so you can just use it directly in without installing it you launch the browser you go to the page and you add a bunch of scripts if you want in this case we don't want that so that's completely fine now the first thing which we can do is uh you know we can still use our traditional node.js style of try catch of you know just making assertions so earlier what we did is we just checked fs.exists sync home dammer 
code index.html for index.html so you can say index file if not index file then we can just say throw new error index.html does not exist right so that there is just you know a try catch relation uh try catch symmetry in the whole file if there's an error we just push false right now the next thing we can do is inside this try catch block we can use page.evaluate to actually get javascript running inside the page and you can consult puppeter docs for how to test with puppeter but what this essentially means is i can just say window.chai.assert we don't need this uh, what we can do is keep it simple for now we can say h1 tag document dot query selector h1 right now if we see that an h1 tag exists then all is okay otherwise we can just throw new error no h1 tag exists on the page right and if we throw the error this promise will throw and this will land us over here if it doesn't throw then we add just results dot push is true remember that you can't do results dot push true over here because this according to puppeter documentation will run in the context of the page itself so this is like this is not running in the context of your main page so we have to do it here otherwise we push the result here and then finally we again just write the results back to the unit test output file i'm going to click save changes and when i do that and if you go back and if you try to run this test again you're going to see the first test this time passes but the second test fails because now we are actually checking h1 with the puppeter thing instead of just making it hard coded with the node.js script so if i uncomment this and if i run this again you're going to see that this test now passes both of these tests now passes let's now try to take a look at this github repository and the scripts within it so we figured out how to run a very simple node.js script with node test file name which takes this edit test file and executes it we are able to run regular node.js scripts and puppeter with them now that's it that's all we have to do the final thing is that writing something on the you know this particular file and as long as we are able to do that doesn't matter how we do it will work now let's just go ahead and take a quick look into what these bash scripts are so if you take a look at this node v test testing i'm going to explain this one uh, for all of you so that we can understand what's going on and you can even create your own scripting files if you want so the first thing is that we go to the user directory this home dammer code is guaranteed to be a stable user directory right that means the user code the place where the playground boots for the user and the place where they add all the files and everything this will be home dammer code then we add vtest through yarn right this is what we do now of course this is slightly uh, will just mess up the user environment if we do this because if they don't have package.json or node modules as a matter of fact for example in this case in this labs case it's just going to install that into their environment but the reason we do that is to just speed up subsequent runs so we add the vtest utility then we make a lab underscore lab test folder now currently we don't hide this folder as such but in future we can just make sure that this folder over here does not appear in the user explorer right so make sure you label your directories as underscore underscore lab tests and anything you put in here would not be visible in the user explorer in the file explorer on the user front then we move our test file name into this lab test folder just to keep it clean and simple and just to make everything clear before this command runs we automatically download and clone this uh, this particular file onto the user system right so if you are making some changes to this file and running the test again once the user clicks on run test the first sequence of thing is we download this file and store it on a path which is available on dollar test file name environment the second thing is that we run the script so you can safely interact with this file move it then we create two files the first one is a vtest config again vtest is a unit testing and integration testing utility you can read the documentation for it if you want to know more and the second file is the file which processes the results of this vtest file now remember that vtest is a testing framework so it does not give you the output in in a boolean 
json array format right it gives you an output in an array it can give you in a json format but in an array which is verbose and we need to map that output to a boolean array which we just saw which is required and then we have to write it so this is exactly what we do over here this payload.json is potentially gonna be the file which we test on which vtest actually writes its results then we just use the syntax of vtest and map and change this particular array from a complex array to something which is just a boolean array right so if you know javascript you will know that this file would result in this line would result in just a bunch of boolean arrays on true and false but not a bunch of boolean arrays just a bunch of values inside a single boolean array then finally we use fs and synchronously write it to the same file just like we have done earlier and we stringify the answers finally we run the vtest utility with config as the one which we have just recently created in this particular block threads false just means that we don't want parallelization because we want it to be written in a specific order so that's important reporter has to be json and the output file we have coded as payload.json once that is done we run this file now in order to process the results so this is what payload.json actually reads and you know runs so you can use this and the reason i'm going to tell you to use this is as follows so if i paste this block over here and if i save this now what i can do is i can click on this edit test file and i can just modify this file to have a unit test like feel or a unit test like environment where i just all i have to do is just work on the file contents so if i go to my custom template and i select node.js and vtest so you see i can have a describe block and i can have these bunch of test blocks so now you can do it if you want to just you know if you're just trying to check some javascript code where you just want to import and then try to you know run assertions against it so you do something like this you can have multiple test blocks it's much more cleaner than just having try catch and writing it to a results array and then writing it to the file once this test utility runs we get the results in this payload.json file which is over here and once this payload.json is generated we map and we parse the result and write it back to the unit test output file just to link it back to the playground so if you know the process if you know these fundamentals which i was talking about now you can build your own scripts and own utilities and i actually recommend you to do so because if you end up creating your own scripts just make sure to send us a pull request on curriculum testing scripts on codedam and i'll be happy to add your script on this whether that is you know some sort of uh, way to test rust or c++ or anything we are looking to expand this library aggressively moving forwards now let's talk a little bit about verified solution as well. So you can see this lab comes with a verified solution. And the reason for this is that I set this lab up, I clicked on this test this lab button, and I also ran this lab with a solution which passed both the challenges. So in order to add a verified solution to your lab, all you have to do is set up a lab and write a solution inside this test lab, test this lab mode, which passes all the challenges. And the moment you do that, our systems will automatically pick that up as a verified solution. Now, of course, you can change the challenges and this verified solution will break. So it's not guaranteed to stay verified. So that is why I recommend once you have done your lab completely, go ahead and test this lab, write up a solution. And once you end up writing up that solution, click on run test and pass all these challenges. Once you do that, refresh this page and you're gonna see that this lab becomes verified. Now, these labs gives you that button which I showed initially in the starting of the video, which show a split view of verified versus what user is currently writing. And it's just super helpful for the end users to see that this is something which they are expected to write and this is what they have written. Once your lab is set up, you're gonna see nothing much changes over here, but the moment somebody now uses this lab in a course or in a curriculum, they would be able to experience a much more interactive and hands-on way of learning. Now, we have discussed everything that is necessary in order for you to build a lab. And as a developer, all you have to do, as a developer and a creator, all you have to do, like we have discussed multiple times, is write a Boolean array result to this particular file or this path to this particular file. Once you do that, we'll take it up. We'll take it up from here. You can do this in Python, Rust, C++, 
the language doesn't matter as long as this file is written with a boolean array it will automatically get mapped correctly on the front end and the users will have a much more richer and interactive experience we have a few limits on hand such as 60 seconds for evaluating the whole lab so if your lab's evaluation takes more than a minute then we will time it out so make sure you keep your evaluations within 60 seconds and in general it is recommended that you don't add hundreds of challenges although it's fine it will work if your scripts are fast but it's better to break that lab into multiple labs if there are hundreds of things which you have to test but that's it basically the fundamentals about building a lab are this i would highly recommend you to check out this github repository for example and check out teach.codedam.com which is a resource for how do you build labs and these documentation resources go into much more details on how do you set up a particular lab with that particular technology, including the evaluation aspect. Finally, what I want to enforce a lot is that once you have watched this video, I really believe that you should go ahead and check out all the pages you can find on teach.codedam.com. There are a few things which I have missed out in this video and there, are, there will be a lot of things which will add to the playground in order to make it better for you. For example, port mapping we have covered, but we will keep this page updated to current standards or you know whatever we have changed. Environment variables. We have talked about unit test output file, test file name, but we haven't talked about secondary public port, public port. Uh, well, we have in a way, but not as an environment variable. So public host name is also something which you can access, right? So remember, we discussed about just using localhost directly in the script. Well, if you want to access it over internet, you can use the public hostname variable and it will give you that. So there are things which will go unnoticed in the video, but the documentation always remains with you. So my best advice, best piece of advice for you is that if you're trying to set up its interactive course and until you get the hang of the full platform, keep this documentation open in a separate tab and refer to it religiously. If you're stuck at any point, go ahead and join our Discord server, which is at cdm.sh slash creator dash Discord. The link for this is also somewhere below in the video. So go ahead and join the server and ping us, ping me at Mehul, ping my team. There are so many people from our team available in the same Discord and make sure if you are stuck, then you let us know because it will help us get you unstuck and help us build a better experience. So that is all for this video. I hope you enjoy building an interactive course as much as I did building all those courses over the years. That is all for this video and I'll see you in some other video really soon. If you're still watching this video, make sure you comment down in the comment section. I watched this video till the end. Also, if you're not part of CodeDamp's Discord community, you're missing out a lot on events which we organize on a weekly basis to code. You already know the drill. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you so much for watching.